Hello and welcome to Michigan and Other Mayhem, the show about Michigan, murder, mysteries, histories, and other mayhem from around the world. Your hosts are Allie and Jen. Okay, Jen, let's do this thing. Hey, Jen. Hello. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> <laughs> I said Allie. Oh, okay. Cue fake podcast music. Ba-da, ba-da, boo-boo. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, so tell me, Miss Bill Defense, how'd it go today? I built a fence. Looks built- good. Mm-hmm. It's standing. Let's not have anybody touch it. Okay. What kind of a fence is it? Is it just, um, is it like the chain link fence that you have on the sides? No, it's a fancy, um, metal fence with like these fancy spindles so it, it's metal black is, metal is it like you had on the one side with the gate yep oh that is nice that yep, is so nice. it you know it just uh yeah we just got fancy around these parts yeah well i always tell it, michael like kings take it to an 11 you know what i mean well so of course you're gonna get something nice <laughs> it's it seriously um took me all day oh, it, it had to be tiring it did and today's podcast yeah is my first podcast in on my ipad yes Ooh. i am not an, i want a disclaimer i am not an apple fan whatsoever okay i Avoid it like the plague. Okay. But I had gift cards for Apple, and my son didn't have anything else he needed. And so I needed a, a new tablet because mine broke so that I can put it on my running machine. And I was like, well, let me look at their tablet. And then I found this Apple Pencil that you use on the iPad, and you just write. And then you can write, and then it'll turn it into text for you, and you can do anything. You know, you can email it, you can do whatever. Or you don't have to turn it into text. So now I wrote my, I wrote today's podcast on my iPad. I feel like I'm just cool. You're just, you're just like, yeah, you went up to an 11. See? I'm like, I'm in the 2020s. Yeah. I'm high tech. You guys know what to do in, in your family. I'm telling you. You're like, no brakes, all gas. And I'm all about that. <laughs> you know? So this could be a little rocky, though, but we'll see. All right, we'll see how it goes. What are you, uh, what you been up to? Okay, nothing much, but basically the same. Avoiding other people, walking a lot. It's got to the point where the dog just looks out and is like, no. I'm so tired of you people walking me, no. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> yes. Before he used to be all excited. Now he's like, oh, my God. And he's a big dude. And he'll be like, you know, he'll start walking further and further behind you. To the, you feel like you're dragging 100 pounds of dog behind you. <laughs> That's funny. <great. laughs> yes. All right. So what's yours going to be about today? Well, hold on. Let me scroll on my iPad. Okay. It is the Morris murders um yeah it's the Morris murders okay in Michigan yes it is Michigan okay I will say hold on I'm sorry yeah no problem. I'm sorry I will say my stories are always Michigan but so everybody can get a good laugh that I do have a story that it's a really short real short story Okay. That I will tell in an upcoming podcast. And it is not Michigan. It is New York. But the whole time I'm like just right jotting it down. Uh-huh. I think it's Michigan because there's an Ithaca, Michigan and an Ithaca, New York. And I got, I, I didn't uh. realize I was in New York. <laughs> I'm like, uh, pretty much done, you know, because it's a real short story. But I was like, Oh, well, somebody's going to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. So I'm sure you... that Ithaca, New York is also interesting. Right. What are you doing? Um, I'm going to talk about different uh, idioms that we have 
in America and different reasons why we say things or uh, why we have different traditions, like in different engagement rings, or why do we call it a soap opera? Oh, yeah, that would be interesting. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me about your murder, please. So let me take you back. I mean, back. Okay. Like way back. Okay. Like September 1879 back. All right. Yep, 1879 in Decanter, D-E-C-A-T-U-R. It's outside of Charleston, Michigan. You've got it right, yeah. The Morris couple lived in an old farmhouse on a country road. One of their farm workers also lived with them, and her name is Jenny. Oh, okay. Oh. Jenny found Charles Morris lying on the front porch and Esther lying in her bed on September 28th. So the Morris couple murdered. They're found in the morning? Yep. Okay. The police investigated the murder and found... um. That the murderer stole the Morris's horse, but nothing else was stolen. They had money and jewelry clearly visible. That's weird as shit. Yeah, but only the horse was taken. Okay, so that immediately gives you a clue as to who it is. Right. Because that person just took the horse when they could have had everything else. (laughs) Right. So they believe Mr. Morris heard someone on the porch... And had went outside to check on things and was shot once he got out onto the porch. And then the murderer went inside and shot Mrs. Morris. That is a living nightmare because Mrs. Morris, she sees her husband get killed and then someone chases her down. That's just, that has to be horrifying. Right. Their neighbor, their neighbor had reported he saw a man. With a funny hat riding past him between 9.30 and 10 p.m. On the Morris's horse. Wow. And I'm not really sure how people know whose horses are whose. Oh, no, because you're not from the country. Yeah, I guess Yeah, no, it's like, yeah. No, like, you know how you know Melanie's car? Yeah. You would know Melanie's horse. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) The horse was found about a week later in South Bend, Indiana. Oh, wow. At this point, you would believe they would look at Jenny, right? Because she's living there. Yeah. But I couldn't find any information on her. Like, anything on her, anything on, like, them investigating her, thinking maybe it's them or her. I did find that they, that the Morses had a handyman, and the police were looking into him. Okay. Until... Until the handyman tells the police, no, I didn't do it. You need to look at Floyd Smith. Oh, who the hell is Floyd Smith? Who, I know. Who is Floyd Smith? I don't even know who Floyd Smith is. I couldn't figure out who Floyd Smith was. But just because the handyman said to look at Floyd Smith, the police go out and arrest Floyd Smith. What? And take him into custody December 17th, 1879. Before they made it to jail, though, okay, so they arrest Floyd Smith, they got him, uh-huh. and now they're headed to jail, but before okay. they before they got to jail, they were ambushed, and Floyd was taken. Wait, the cops with Floyd in the car are ambushed, and then someone yep. takes Floyd out of the back of the car? Yep, somebody okay. takes Floyd out of the car, okay. He was, and Floyd was taken into the woods, tortured. And told to confess. Okay. So That's now we horrible. got. That is like a, an extra layer of horrification. If there's <laughs> right? a word I just made up. Or it might be really a word. But that is just. Uh, yep. So yeah. now he's in the woods. He's being tortured. And told to confess. But he, did, he didn't. He didn't confess. Okay. Because he didn't do it. Well, I guess he's not going to confess. I don't know if he's going to do it. Okay. But but he's not admitting to doing it. And what, you know, who did this to him, right? Who who put him in the woods to torture him? 
Yeah. I don't know because I can't find anything on it. Are you kidding me? No, I couldn't find nothing on it. I looked everywhere. I couldn't find nothing. All it, And really how this goes is we don't know who Floyd is. Oh, shit. So, so handyman, house police, handyman is a suspect. He no longer is a suspect because he told the police to look at Floyd. Police arrest Floyd. Floyd gets kidnapped, tortured, and um, killed. No. Oh, thank God. I I don't know what happened. I don't know how he got away. Okay. I do know, though. I will say this. I do know he wasn't charged because the case is unsolved. What? Yeah. Isn't it weird? That I have is no idea. Crazy. Where did that right. take place? It. The cancer? This is. Yep. Yeah. That is just insane. <laughs> yeah, I know. And so, so it's complete. The so nothing on anybody looking at Jenny. The handyman gets out of it because he gave a different person's name. And who's Floyd? Where did he go? What happened to Floyd? So everybody knows he was tortured and somebody tried to get him to confess. But so obviously he lived. Where did he go? What happened to him? I don't know. That is case insane. Is, case is unsolved. But wow. it doesn't stop there. But we all know the case is unsolved. But Mr. and Mrs. Morris have been buried. And they are in Anderson Cemetery. And this is in Marcellus, Michigan is where the cemetery is. Uh -huh. And it is said on the anniversary of the murder, their headstone glows and you can see Charles and Esther. Ooh. It glows? Yeah. <sighs> and, then, and then somebody from Michigan is going to go, Jen, where is Charleston, Michigan? Because I told you they lived in Decanter, right, right by Charleston, Michigan. Okay. And pretty much it is Charleston, Michigan, Charleston, Michigan you know? Uh-huh. But, but somebody in Michigan is going to be like, Jen, you don't know what you're talking about. Because there isn't a Charleston, Michigan. Uh -huh. And that is correct. There isn't. Because that town vanished in 1879. Ooh. What happened? After after the murder of Mr. and Mrs. Morris. It's just said that residents started selling their homes because they believed the area to be haunted with them. Oh, no shit. So, Mr. and Mrs. Morris. Wow. And then that same year, people just start moving, and then there is no town anymore because nobody lives there. I am actually, in a couple weeks, going to tell you a story about how towns disappear also. Yeah, well, in a different set of circumstances. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, this whole thing, very interesting. Yeah. Lots of articles that said the same stuff. Yeah. And I just couldn't. I'm like, who's Floyd? Does somebody know who Floyd is? If somebody does know who Floyd Smith is, they need to tell me because it really bothers me. Like, where did he go? Right. All right. Oh, I bet it's going to be hard to find a Floyd Smith because Smith is a surname that a lot of people have. Right. All right. I'm going to talk about uh, different idioms and or reasons why we do things. And I found it in so many different places. I got it from the Atlantic. I got it from today. I found out. I got it from Wonder Op Wonderopolis, which I think honestly is a cool name. Like if I ever had a lot of money, I would just build this crazy looking house and call it Wonderopolis. I got right. it. From, yeah. Right. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> and then I would do. Oh, then I would do. And then I got some from Drugstore Education. I got bestoflifeonline.com, work.cron.com, and thegrammarist.com. Are you ready? I am ready. The re Do you know why we call it soap opera before I even tell you? Am I going to tell you something you already know? No, I have no, I have no idea okay. why it's called that. Okay, so I'm like, oh, phew. I thought I was going to tell you stuff, and you'd be like, yeah, yeah, everybody knows. <laughs> okay. So during the 1920s, radio was the main form of entertainment in America. And radio shows were called serials, and they played out stories during the day. 
And radio stations hope to make more money by getting companies to sponsor their cereals. And the first major sponsors were Procter & Gamble, Colgate, um, Colgate, Colgate and Palmolive, and the Lever Brothers. And they were all companies that were major soap manufacturers. And the cereals that played during the day were aimed at women during this time. And the cereals provided like romance, betrayal, and drama, just like an opera would if they had gone to the theater. And mm-hmm. the sponsorship of the dramatic cereals by soap companies led people to begin to call them soap operas. Oh, all right. <laughs> so later the cereals moved from radio to TV and the name of soap opera stuck. Okay. okay now I'm going cool. to do one that why a lot of people have diamond rings with um, yellow gold for their engagement and wedding rings. There's because and weirdly enough, none of my sisters nor I have a gold a uh, yellow gold ring with diamonds as our wedding ring. Everybody has a different gem besides a diamond. And I have white gold. I think my sisters do have yellow gold, though. But are you ready to, to find out why we do it? Yeah, why do we do it? All right. So the De Beers Company started in the 1800s by these British businessmen. And they took over the South African mines. And they're controlling the diamond industry. And those guys, they're honestly, they're real bastards, but that's just for a different day. That's not in the story. Okay. (laughs) So the diamond company took a hit during the Great Depression, right? You can't afford to eat. You're not buying diamond jewelries. So in 1839, Harry Oppenheimer, who was the son of the De Beers company, hires this ad agency in New York to help them with their image and to boost sales in New York. And this ad agency just like took diamonds to the next level. The company showed all these female movie stars being proposed to with diamond rings. You know, they paid them, you know, gave them the rings, paid them to do it. And they worked to connect the diamonds to romance. And by the late 1940s, the De Beers Company had lectures going on in high schools to talk about how the only way a man can show his value to his fiance is to buy her a diamond ring. And this is when a lot of people in the country were getting married right out of high school. Um, If you're in the country and actually people in the city were getting married at a higher age, like 21 for women and 28 for men in the 1940s. And so they're going to the young people and it's really it's starting to affect them. And just to let you know, the current age for getting married is 28 for women and 29 for men. Really? Yes. That's the the first by a lot. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Well, I, I got married at 26 and then again at like 34, I think something like that. Uh, the Okay, so this uh, ad company, Weekly, would send out articles to about 125 newspapers about diamonds being worn by stars in society, like pumping up the pub- publicity in the society pages. And the New York ad agency created the slogan, Diamonds Are Forever. Does that sound familiar to you? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. was the agency did that. And their ad campaigns were successful. And they're giving, you know, people are giving diamonds as engagement rings and... It's what people begin to believe now is a tradition, right? It's what everybody does. Between 1939 and 1979, De Beers diamond sales in the United States went from $23 million to $2.1 a billion. Oh, with a B. Wow. Yes. In 1976, in Japan, 5% of Japanese women had diamond engagement rings. The De Beers company began their campaign over there. And by 1981, the number of Japanese um, fiancés with diamond rings were up to 60%. It went from 5% to 60%. I was like, these guys, they're good. (laughs) You know? So previous to the rise of the De Beers ad campaign that made us do diamonds and gold, the engagement rings were often handed down through generations. And the bands were usually like plain metal or maybe even engraved metal or just like local gemstones. Your brother actually um, designed my ring, and the gemstone is my birthstone. So I was like, yes, thank you. And my favorite color. So I just felt like I won a thousand times over because it's purple. (laughs) So some of the idioms are, um, do you know a dime a dozen? Yeah. Okay, so a dime a dozen means something's like you have a lot of something and it doesn't have a lot of value. And this came from the dime being first minted in 1796. And during the 1800s, common items like eggs and apples were placed on sale for a dime a dozen. So people are like, yeah, dime a dozen. Hmm. Now the piece of cake one, 
kind of messed me up. Um, it, I didn't, when I looked it up, I'm like, this sucks. It, <laughs> it originated with slavery in the United States. So in the U.S., some states allowed and promoted slavery. And it was in those states that they would hold a competition between their slaves. And they would be arranged in a circle around a cake or like a piece of cake during a party, often in pairs. And then the slaves were judged by their owners and party goers on how, how they like walked or stood or danced. And the couple that was deemed best looking or most graceful would like win the cake in the middle of the circle or the piece of cake. And their win was considered an easy way for a slave to get, you know, a treat that is something, you know, a treat to a white person. So I was just like, oh, fuck. Mm. And this is where the term cakewalk, meaning something's easy to accomplish, came from. And it's also that's where a piece of cake, you know, when someone says, oh, was it, you know, how hard was it? And you're like, oh, it's a piece of cake. That means it's yeah. easy. So when I was in elementary school, we would have cakewalks as part of our school fair. Did you ever do that? No. You've never been on a cakewalk? Okay, no. they called it a cakewalk, and I didn't know what it was, swear swearsies. So we would walk in a circle in the gymnasium. There'd be a circle taped on the floor, and it would be, like, cut off with lines, and each little um, square that goes around the circle that was cut off would have uh, a number on it, and you just walk the circle, walk the circle. And the, they would play music, and a teacher would reach into this bin and pull out this piece of paper, and there'd be a number on it. And whoever was standing, you know, in that number square, because there was, like, little squares around the thing, would get the cake. You could walk over to the table, and there'd be a free cake for you to get. And I used Are you to, serious? Yes. I used to love to do that. And one year, well, I won, of course like, three cakes. Cake. Oh, I don't like cake, and I haven't liked cake since I was eight years old. I just like winning cake. And I remember at one point, my mom said to me, do not get another freaking cake because I came back with like three cakes at one point <laughs> and I don't even eat cake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm a weird adult and I was a weird kid. Like I've been weird my whole life. <laughs> I think it's funny that I don't like cake. I just like winning cake. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Swear to God. And I had to be told to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why we say knock on wood that's like an idiom is when we're looking for good luck and so we knock on wood and we're trying to wake up the fairies that live in the wood so we can get their attention and they can provide us good luck and we can ask them for luck that's why we yeah knock on my wood. fairies suck your fairies fell asleep you knock on the wood they're like later yeah <laughs> yeah like screw you if you've ever heard the term, I don't know if you've heard the term long in the tooth because it's kind of an older term when you're kind of a younger person. <laughs> no, I've never heard of it. I didn't think so. Okay, so it's almost a little long in the tooth. That means they're like middle-aged or older. And that comes from horse traders. Horses' teeth continue to grow as they age. And a horse with long teeth is, a long, is an older horse. You know, their gums are receding, their teeth are going. Okay, do you know okay. what it means if somebody whiffed? If I was like, no. oh, man, I was playing baseball and I just whiffed. No. Okay, so whiffed means you missed. It's an example of onomatopoeia, and that's when a word sounds like the noise it's describing. So when I was a kid, like in school, they always used the examples for onomatopoeia. Words were like buzz, and the word buzz sounds like a buzzing sound, like a bee. Or boom, like an explosion. When something explodes, it actually sounds like it makes the, you know, boom. So when you whiff, it's the sound that a bat makes when it passes through the air and misses the ball. You know that noise. I know you do. <laughs> Where you like cut the air like. That's yeah. And I, but <laughs> what I'm thinking right now is that if you would have just said that to me, I'd probably have been like, what did you do? Fart? Okay. Now, it's funny you say that. Do you want to know what your brother did to me at Meyer today? Hmm. So I said, oh, man, I, too bad I can't get any ice cream because I cannot have ice cream. I've tried all the different lactose pills. My stomach still hurts. I just have to admit that I can't have any ice cream. Your brother's like, just get it. And I was like, no, I can't get it. He's like, that's okay. Eat it tonight. You'll fart all tomorrow. And he said it so <laughs> loud that like the three or four people that were biased turned and looked. <laughs> that's so great. And I just laughed. I was like, thanks, Mike. <laughs> well, I have a great, Yeah. on a side note, I actually do have a good ice cream that you can try. Oh, yeah? Yeah, that's dairy free that I eat. It's Sweet. really good. All right, I'll give it a try. But that is it. kind of that is hilarious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, thanks, man. <laughs> Everybody's looking now. <sighs> good thing I have a mask on. They won't recognize me later. <laughs> 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 All 
Okay, so the rest of the the next couple ones, I'm just going to do a couple more. It has to do with graves and like, okay. So, you know, people are afraid of being buried alive, right? Yeah. So when there were plagues and there were like mass deaths, math, mass deaths, <laughs> that was hard for me to say, <laughs> in the 1500s, people would sometimes like, you know, recover when from injury or sickness when they thought they were going to die. Or, you know, sometimes people would not be quite dead and it made people get worried that they would get buried underground and die when you wake up, right? Yeah. So this caused people to have coffins built with like fans or bells or vents on them. And mm -hmm. so that you could like let somebody know you're there and you can get air in the same time. And so in order for that process to work, somebody would need to sit in the graveyard and like listen for the bell or watch for the fan, you know, to open up so that you would know that person you know pulled it otherwise it's not going to work right if you ring the bell and nobody's around it doesn't help anything right so people now this is what people this is not right this is me correcting things so people used to think that the term saved by the bell came from that situation right you would have otherwise been suffocated in the coffin but you were saved by ringing the bell and someone knew you're alive mm -hmm. but that's not right that's not right and another mistake was they said that the, the term graveyard shift came from being a bell ringer at the listener job, like the little fan watcher bell ringer guy. And that person was considered to have the graveyard shift, sitting and listening for bells or lo looking for the fans. And as time went on, graveyard shift came to identify people, you know, working overnight. And another one more mistake is people think that the term dead ringer is also like connected to this story. Like the people came back from the dead and rang the bell to be let out. So, but here's the truth. Here's the right stuff. Okay. The safety coffin, coffin was actually built in the 1800s, 300 years later. And at this time in history, medicine had advanced enough and being buried alive wasn't a concern anymore. And the reason why we say graveyard shift is because late nights can be like quiet and lonely like a graveyard. <laughs> yeah, that's why. Mm -hmm. And the term graveyard yeah. shift was first written in a document May 25th, 1885 in a New York newspaper. And they were talking about something being like a hospital being really slow during a graveyard shift. Like it was so slow that it was like a graveyard. And the term dead ringer means someone that looks almost exactly like another person. Right? Really? Yeah. So if I said, oh man, Jen, I met your twin. She was like a dead ringer for you. That means she looks exactly like you. So the term dead ringer comes from sports, where today, even today, we call someone a ringer when they substitute for another player. And in the past, when it came to horse racing, when sometimes a slower horse would be replaced with a faster horse that looked exactly like the slow horse to throw off betting. So you would run the slow horse and let everybody see that the horse is not that fast. And then before the race, you know, then you bet on the race and then you switch it out for a fast horse so you could win. And the fast horse looks exactly like the slow horse. And that lookalike fast horse would be called a dead ringer for the original horse with dead meaning exact. You know, when we say something is dead center, yeah. I mean, it's the exact center. So a dead ringer is an exact substitute. Uh-huh. Hmm. Uh-huh. I know. I learned that too. I didn't know. I didn't know that either. I didn't know that. And the last one also comes from sports, the saved by the bell. But this time, it's actually boxing, and a boxer would be saved by the bell if he was getting beat up, and then the bell rang to stop the round. And that also came from the 1800s. It was not the 1500s, so. Oh. Yes. That's interesting. Yeah, I thought that was, too. And so many stuff, I'm like, I didn't know that. No. Yeah. All right, Jen. Well, I will talk to you later. Oh. All right. I can't wait to hear your next story. <laughs> Can't wait to hear yours. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Contact us at Anchor or Michigan and Other Mayhem at gmail.com or on Facebook to join the conversation, listen to the podcast, or correct us when necessary. Rate and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast provider. Bye-bye now.